All right, everyone, welcome to season four of National Parks Presents. I know I'm not supposed to say it, but I say it every single season and I say it every single time. It's my favorite program of all time. I love this program. Today is our second of eight presentations that will take place every other Wednesday evening until the end of April. So we started it uh, two weeks ago and it will go through the end of April. Uh, but before I go into our Zoom features, um, I do want to remind everyone that the BPL does have a great research services department um, and that the Boston Public Library is a repository of the amazing National Park Service materials, um, along with other government publications, um, and they can be found at the BPL Research Services Department. Um, and if there's anything specific you're looking for, you can always email ask at bpl.org. Um, they know they do a lot of, I think they do research appointments and things of that nature. Um, and so our research department was like, hey, you guys are wonderful. Share, please share this news. So we're sharing it. Um, now for boring Zoom features. We are recording. Lucky you, you got my rambling in the beginning. Uh, but we are recording. We've started recording during halfway through season one. And you can catch up on this series or past ones um, on our BPL YouTube page. I'll put that in the chat once, once I'm off the screen. Um, if you do not enjoy the closed captionings that are on, you can click them off by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, if they aren't on and you do want them on, you click on that same button and hit turn them on, please. Um, and you can turn them on. If you'd like to ask questions, we do have a few of the questions from um, when you registered, you added some pre-program questions. We do have those. Um, but if you want to ask questions during the program, click on the chat button at the bottom. This is one of the rare places that a big webinar such as this has the chat open. It's because you guys are wonderful and you're filled with knowledge and just so many fun thoughts and like contributing things that uh, we keep it open. Um, we just ask you be respectful, which honestly everyone has been. So thank you very much for that. Um, the chat is being moderated by an amazing individual tonight. Her name is Ranger Jennifer Steele um, because Sean is doing the presentation. So we're gonna switch it on you today. Um, so Jennifer is going to be looking through the chat and then she'll come on on the screen um, and moderate the chat. She's amazing, you'll love her. Um, she's also doing the one in two weeks from now. So you'll see her as the actual presenter too. So she's amazing. Um, all right, as you can see, I like to talk. So without further babbling from me, oh, more babbling. I do want to have you guys notice the to form. So notice when you're, if you're putting in your question, notice who you're sending it to. It, I believe it defaults to host and panelists. Host and panelists are everyone you can see on the screen. So that includes Jennifer, myself, and Sean. Um, and everyone includes the three of us plus all of you back home. Um, it's whatever, whatever you're feeling. Again, just be respectful. Um, now it's time for no more babbling from me. So let's all welcome Ranger Sean Quigley as he presents Abolition in Boston, John Brown's Boston. <laughs> all right, everyone. Good evening. Uh, let me just share my screen here momentarily and we can get started. All right. Awesome. All right. So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, come for this uh, virtual lecture. Uh, so the what we're going to be doing tonight uh, over the next probably like 30 or so minutes uh, is discussing and exploring uh, one of the most polarizing and um, interesting figures in American history, in, in my view anyway, and that is the man you see here, John Brown. Um, but in particular, what I wanted to do was look at John Brown and tell John Brown's story, but also through a lot of his strong connections to the city of Boston, um, because Brown found a lot of support um, and aid for what would eventually become the raid on Harper's Ferry from individuals in Boston and individuals that had very strong ties to the city. So who is John Brown? What do you think of when you 
hear the name John Brown and, and what are the images that come to mind? You know, I think you see a lot of a, a spectrum with John Brown kind of from the image on the left to the image on the right. Uh, the image on the left, and uh, I will just say that I do have a, a couple quotes that I'll be Yeah, uh, example of John Brown is this wild madman, right? Um, someone who is towering over everyone. He's got a massive beard, gun in hand, map in the other. And, you know, he embodies that 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 lunatic, that that terrorist, that that person who, you know, went in and and sees that arsenal in Harper's Ferry, right? And there's death and, and violence and, and obviously the civil war going on in the background, right? But on the right, you have another painting um, and it's called The Last Moments of John Brown, late 19th century. And, and here it's the, the old grandfather, right? The, the wise old man walking to his death, but on the way there, He's kissing the forehead of a young African-American child being held up by its mother. And this is the, the Christ-like John Brown, right? And I don't think that John Brown is, is all of one of these things or all of another. You know, I think he, he very much fits in the center in a lot of ways. And he did unforgivable things. Um, but I think he also, you know, fought for a cause that he strongly believed in and, and was a cause fighting against the institution of slavery that was just. Do his actions justify the cause? You know, I think that is a question that is still very much debated today. So what I want to do is I want to look at John Brown, explore his life, origins, time in Kansas, his plans for Harper's Ferry, and ultimately what occurs there. And we'll weave in the connections to Boston as they come. So John Brown is born in Connecticut, 1800. This is the house that he was born in. And he's out in... He ends up moving um, out on the Western Reserve area that today, uh, you know, makes up a lot of Ohio. And during his youth, you know, he was in an area where there still were enslaved people. Um, small numbers, but, you know, slavery did exist in a lot of northern states, you know, no um, exception, even here in Massachusetts. Now, Brown had a formative moment in his youth regarding the institution of slavery where um, according to notes, he actually did see the, the beating of a 12-year-old slave boy. And this was a very formative experience for a young John Brown, um, who could tie his hatred to the institution of slavery, not only to what he experienced later, but goes back to this memory as one that really influences his hatred of this institution. Now, Brown will first marry in 1820. Um, unfortunately, his wife did pass. He would remarry. And ultimately, he had 20 children between two wives. And uh, 11 of those children would live into adulthood. Nine died in infancy. And during this time period, he engages in dozens of business ventures. Um, he is working in wool. He's trying all different ways to make money. And essentially, all of them fail. Um, he was doing businesses across several northern states. He, instead of accumulating financial assets, mostly just accumulates debt and lawsuits. And by the early 1850s, his family is poor, poverty stricken. 
Uh, and he's essentially living almost this like rolling stone existence. Um, but what, what is maintained throughout this, not only is his deep hatred of the institution of slavery, but also religion. Um, John Brown was deeply religious and he was a Calvinist. Um, he was a strong Calvinist, believed in things such as innate depravity, providential design, predestination, and he also believed that God sometimes chose certain individuals to act for him, to act for God, which is something that John Brown later sees as his sole mission, why he was put on this earth to eradicate the institution of slavery as an instrument of God. He believes in the Old Testament, you know, especially Old Testament kind of justice, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And by the end of the early, you know, from 1820 into the early 1850s, Brown is relocated kind of throughout the northern United States, but eventually he settles in North Elba, New York, upstate New York, kind of near Lake Placid. This is the uh, home of John Brown, a uh, photograph from the 20th uh, or 21st century. Um, and it is here that Brown will receive letters from his children talking about what is going on in Kansas. The violence in Kansas about slavery, and they ask Brown to join them, which he will do, setting him on a path to Harper's Ferry. But why is John Brown going to Kansas? What is happening there? Well, backtracking a little bit from 1856, where we'll pick up Brown's story when he gets to Kansas, 1854. This is a map of the United States um, that signifies free states, slave states. Free states are in red, slave states are uh, dark gray or black, and then the free territory, which is green. Um, or just territory, so it has not, you know, been determined as a slave state or a free state. And the country during this time period, as you can kind of see by this map, it is expanding westward, right? And within those new territories applying for statehood, you're getting essentially, every time this happens, a constitutional crisis. Um, you have the Missouri Compromise of 1820, where Missouri becomes a slave state, top part of Massachusetts, is cut off and becomes Maine as a free state, equalizing the balance of power in Washington, D.C. You also have, in 1850, the Compromise of 1850, California is admitted as a free state. Here, Kansas and Nebraska territories are applying for statehood. Are they going to be slave states or free states? Naturally, major debate takes place in Congress, and the solution to this problem is uh, or orchestrated and authored by Stephen Douglas, senator from the state of Illinois, and it is known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And essentially what Stephen Douglas is introducing is this idea of popular sovereignty, the idea that settlers, people who are in the territories, can vote for statehood, can apply not only to become a state, but also vote whether they're going to be a slave state or a free state. Now, essentially what this does is it repeals the Missouri Compromise, which, which many people felt was a, a sacred promise, um, especially in the North. This idea that there's a, an imaginary line running across the United States, everything to the North of Missouri would be free, everything to the South would be a slave state. Uh, the idea of popular sovereignty obviously completely changes that. Um, this, in theory, may sound good, but it creates major violence, major uproar, where you have pro-slavery Missourians coming in to the territory of Kansas to try to, you know, dictate what is going to happen there, whether it's going to be a free state or a slave state. And you also have um, anti-slavery um, Midwesterners, people from New England going to Kansas to also try to influence these elections. This becomes known as Bleeding Kansas, which many historians look at as a precursor to the Civil War. Violence erupts. Um, 
in the territory of Kansas. Competing governments are set up. Um, and then you actually have an anti-slavery hub of Lawrence, Kansas, burned to the ground by pro-slavery settlers. So this is occurring in 1856. John Brown is in Kansas at this time period. And the sacking of Lawrence enrages Brown and his followers, many of which with him are his sons, people related to him. What happens also while well, simultaneously the sacking of Kansas, um, or sorry, excuse me, the sacking of Lawrence, you also have on a national stage another event that will enrage Brown um, and many Northerners, to be clear. And that is what occurs in 1856 with uh, the beating of a Massachusetts senator by the name of Charles Sumner. So what you see here is an image of a man named Preston Brooks who will do the beating of Charles Sumner, but he does so on behalf of his um, relative, um, because Sumner will get up on the Senate floor in 1856. He delivers a speech called The Crime Against Kansas. And in this speech, not only does he attack this idea of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, but he actually also attacks a Southern senator verbally by the name of Andrew Butler. What he discusses in this speech is he actually speaks about an open secret, that Butler has fathered children um, with people that he has enslaved. Um, this was an open secret, but not one that, you know, at the time period was supposed to be said on the Senate floor. Sumner calls him out on this and talks about how he has taken, you know, this mistress, this harlot slavery. Brooks decides he's going to get revenge and responds by beating Sumner near to death on the Senate floor with a cane. Um, Sumner barely survives, never fully recovers from these injuries. Brooks will resign his post, immediately is voted back in, and actually receives hundreds of canes in the mail uh, for his actions. Now, the timeline doesn't totally line up. There are some sources that indicate that Brown heard about this and this made him snap. Other sources indicate that, you know, it's unlikely that Brown would have heard about the beating of Sumner um, before the event that I'm about to talk about. But either way, this is something that would enrage John Brown, regardless of when he hears about it. But the sacking and burning of Lawrence, Kansas, the beating of Sumner, Brown wants to get revenge against the violence perpetrated by these pro-slavery advocates. And in May of 1854, in the middle of the night, John Brown and his sons will go along Potomotomy Creek, pull out pro-slavery men from their beds, and murder them in cold blood. Uh, this becomes known as the Potomotomy Creek Massacre. And it really escalates the violence that is occurring in Kansas between pro-slavery and anti-slavery um, forces. Now, rumors swirl about Brown's involvement in the Potawatomi Creek Massacre, but his involvement is downplayed, especially in the North among anti-slavery press. There are rumors of his involvement, but it is not explicitly stated. And subsequent, you know, quite literally battles that take place between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces, many of which John Brown is involved in, including um, what is referred to as the Battle of Blackjack, as well as the Battle of Osawatomie, which Brown is able to repel for hours, this overwhelming pro-slavery force, give him a lot of, you know, um, credentials and, and give him a positive reputation. And also, after these fights, he's worn down. It gives him an excuse to leave Kansas, to go on a fundraising tour that brings Brown for one of the first times to the city of Boston. And Boston, during this time period, is one of the true epicenters of the anti-slavery movement, spearheaded by Boston's free African-American community that resided in the north slope of Beacon Hill, um, which is where uh, I, as well as Ranger Jen work, uh, definitely worth checking out to see the Black Heritage Trail, which is a walking tour that explores that community. 
But because of those strong anti-slavery ties, you have a lot of sympathy towards the anti-slavery forces in Kansas. And what you're looking at here is a slide that explores the New England Immigrant Company, as well as the Kansas Aid Committee. So in January of 1857, Brown arrives on a cold, wintry day in Boston. And he has with him a letter of introduction to meet a young man named Frank Sanborn, who you see here, um, the image of the picture. Sanborn's 25 years old. He's from Concord, Massachusetts, and he is a very smart individual as well as a very well-connected abolitionist. Uh, he operated in the circles with Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, the Transcendentalist Movement. He's involved in all of it. And he also serves as the secretary of the Massachusetts State Kansas Commission. And Sanborn is enthralled by John Brown, hearing Brown's stories, often referred to as the old man, right? The warrior from Kansas. These men are sending money, supplies, and sympathy towards Kansas, but Brown's the one who's in the trenches really doing the fighting. And through Sanborn's connections, Brown is able to meet and operate in some of the highest most powerful anti-slavery circles in the city. You know, he's meeting with Theodore Parker, minister. He's meeting with Thomas Wentworth Higginson, you know, strong anti-slavery activist from Worcester. Amos Lawrence, Samuel Gridley Howe, very wealthy anti-slavery advocates. And he even got into a spirited debate with William Lloyd Garrison uh, during one of these dinners. Um, white abolitionist, founder of the Liberator newspaper, you know, they fiercely debated, you know, Garrison's pacifism, John's old Brown, you know, John's Old Testament justice. Um, Garrison was fascinated by him, but Brown did not take to Garrison, referred to um, Garrison's tactics as milk and water abolitionism. You know, he spends the next few months, he's touring these halls, going into these dining rooms, and he's raising money. He's acquiring promises for weapons to go fight this battle in Kansas. But he's not a very good public speaker. <laughs> um, you know, his, his, his actions definitely spoke louder than his words. Um, and in fact, one minister from Worcester actually described John Brown as a flame of fire in action, but someone who was dull in speech. And he's getting ready to leave Boston, to go back to Kansas, to continue this fight. But before he does, he has one stop. And that stop is at the home of Charles Sumner, the man who was beaten near to death on the Senate floor, the man that some believe inspired his attack at Pottawatomie. This is uh, Sumner's home today. And Brown, according to one source, comes to this home and knocks on the door. Sumner answers it, and Brown asks to hold the coat that Sumner was wearing during that day. He was beaten on the Senate floor. Sumner obliges, gets it for him. Still, apparently, according to this source, has some blood stains on it. And Brown did not say anything, but apparently his lips were compressed and his eyes shown like polished steel. So Brown goes to Kansas, but by the time he is back, tensions have cooled. Violence is diminished, and the support, without bloodshed, fighting, is beginning to dry up. Brown is running out of money. Brown is running out of supplies. He wants to do something bigger. Again, he sees himself as an agent of God to who was put on this earth to destroy the institution of slavery. And he begins to make his way back, back east. And on his way, he actually stops at Frederick Douglass's house in Rochester, New York, where he will stay in Frederick Douglass's attic for about three weeks. During this time period, though, he is beginning to formulate his plan, which will eventually become the raid on Harper's Ferry. And he is called back to Boston. 
while in Boston, he goes to this hotel. Um, it's called the American House. It's no longer standing, but it was located on Hanover Street, the location of which is roughly by where the Boston Public Market is today, uh, just on the other side of the Greenway. And it is here that he is meeting again with some really important anti-slavery figures. He met with Garrett Smith, a very wealthy individual in upstate New York. He already knew Frank Sanborn. And he's meeting Theodore Parker, Sam and Ridley Howe, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, George Luther Stearns. And it's these individuals who form up what becomes known as the Secret Six. And what you're looking at here is a letter that John Brown wrote to Thomas Wentworth Higginson saying that they can meet March 1858. During this meeting, Brown explains to these men that, you know, he sees himself as an instrument of God to invade the South and destroy slavery. And it is here that he begins to talk about how he wants to take the fight to Africa. And Africa, for him, was a code word for the South. After this meeting, support for Brown by these men will be solidified. And as Thomas Wentworth Higginson wrote when calling for funds for Brown for this new venture, which no one was exactly quite sure what he was planning, but regardless, what Higginson said was that you should give money to John Brown because he is the stuff of which martyrs are made. So in the winter of 1858, John Brown goes back into Kansas. Now, throughout this winter of 1858, you know, into 1859, despite this strong initial support from the Secret Six, it is beginning to waver a bit. And this, um, I apologize, this is an image of the members of the Secret Six. Uh, you have George Luther Stearns, Garrett Smith, Frank Sanborn, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Theodore Parker, Samuel Gridley Howe. These are, you know, the key northern supporters, many of which located right here in the Boston area. Um, you know, Thomas Wentworth Higginson really uh, solidly located in Worcester. Garrett Smith more in New York and Frank Sanborn in Concord, but a lot of them had business in Boston um, quite frequently. Um, Stearns lived in Medford. Parker just outside of the city. Sam Gridley Howe lived quite literally on Beacon Hill. You can go visit the site of his home uh, today. Uh, but it is a private residence. Regardless, support is beginning to win. Brown actually will lead when he gets word that there is a family in Missouri of enslaved individuals that are going to be sold and the family is broken apart. Brown leads a daring raid in the middle of the winter into Missouri. He attacks three farms, small plantations, seizes 11 enslaved individuals, one of the owners is killed, and then went back across the border into Kansas. And then he engaged in an 82-day wintertime trek of over a thousand miles, where he's bringing these enslaved individuals north while there are fugitive slave catchers in hot pursuit. He puts them all in a train, he gets them on board this train, and he's taking them across into Detroit and then eventually into Canada. And during this trek, it turns out there was actually now a 12th person because a baby had been born. And that baby was named John Brown Daniels. The rescue, and this um, is an image of that rescue that was done by a uh, painter named Jacob Lawrence who did a series on John Brown called The Legend of John Brown in 1841, looking at this trek um, heading north, reinvigorates the Secret Six. And you're gonna see more support coming in as he is formulating his plans. Now, one person I do want to highlight in addition to the Secret Six that, you know, his involvement with John Brown is, is not as, as celebrated as these members of the Secret Six, but someone who is very much involved within this effort is the man you see here, Lewis Hayden. Now, Lewis Hayden uh, was someone who was born in Kentucky. He was born enslaved. 
would escape enslavement with his wife, Harriet, settle here in Boston at this home, 66 Phillips Street, stop on the Black Heritage Show tour, and turn the home into one of the most well-known underground railroad safe houses here in the city. Now, Hayden is operating in high levels of anti-slavery circles, and he is also someone who's very much an individual of action. You know, he and Harriet had you know, loaded guns inside their house, were willing to fight off slave catchers if necessary. So Hayden is informed of this plot for John Brown. And Hayden, with this information, will actually solicit and receive $500 in funds from a man named um, Francis Merriam, as well as six recruits. And will send all of those individuals down south to Harper's Ferry when John Brown is their planet. So Hayden is someone who is going to become very involved in this plot from Boston. He actually will be corresponding with John Brown's son, sending letters out to Harriet Tubman to try to get her to come to Boston to join and eventually head down south to join the raid at Harper's Ferry. So here is someone, again, who is within this free black community, who is working and operating within these circles, but is someone that is not as well known as other members of the Secret Six. But regardless, through that support, through that fundraising, acquiring of men, weapons, people, you're beginning to see the plan at Harper's Ferry to formulate. Now, members of the Secret Six knew that Brown was planning to, as he said, take the war into Africa. But they did not know exactly where he was plotting to attack. And what you see here is an image of a photograph of Harper's Ferry, uh, which at the time was in Virginia, now West Virginia. Harper's Ferry is a, at the time, was a federal arsenal. It was where, you know, hundreds of thousands of weapons were manufactured by the United States Army. And though unbeknownst to many of his supporters exactly, again, what his plans were, Brown looked at this as a golden opportunity, a place where he can acquire a bunch of weapons, seize them, start a slave insurrection, arm enslaved people, and spread that throughout the South. This is going to be John Brown's plan. But people are not totally aware of it, because at this time, John Brown is being very secretive. He's essentially asking for money and guns, no questions asked. Certain few people are aware of it. Lewis Hayden becomes one of those individuals. It is during this time period, though, in the lead up to October of 1859, that the word of the raid almost gets out. Because though Brown was strong in his convictions, he was never very good with money, never very good with financial decision making. And he had actually hired a man named Hugh Forbes, who was an eccentric military leader, to try to train John Brown's army. Forbes did not receive enough of payment that he felt he was due and actually begins to start leaking some of the plans of John Brown's raid in Washington, D.C. to senators like William Seward and Henry Wilson of Massachusetts. Members of the Secret Six begin to get word that this is happening. They call an emergency meeting. They start to get cold feet. They ask John Brown to come back to Boston, which he will do. Through a series of meetings, places like the Revere Hotel, which is located roughly by the Bowdoin T station today, Brown will talk through some of the plans. Again, they're not totally exactly clear where he's going, but they are afraid that he might be doing something bigger. And they're not sure that they want to have their names attached to it. That is everyone except for Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was steadfast in his support of John Brown throughout his entire life. And Brown will appease these members of the Secret Six. And he calm everything down. And then eventually... He's going to head out to Virginia. But before he does that, he will go to the house of Wendell Phillips, an abolitionist in Boston. And it is there that he actually met and brought with him 
well, sorry, not met. He brought with him to Wendell Phillips's house, Harriet Tubman. And Wendell Phillips would later recall, the last time I ever saw John Brown was under my own roof, as he brought Harriet Tubman to me, saying, Mr. Phillips, I bring you one of the best and bravest persons on this continent, General Tubman, as we call her. That was the last time Phillips would see Brown. It was the last time many in Boston would see Brown. So Brown would go to Harper's Ferry with 22 men. He rents a farm just outside of Harper's Ferry called the Kennedy Farm, which you see here. He tried desperately to get Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman to join him in this raid. Both declined. Brown will continue with his plans. October 16th, 1859, John Brown begins his raid on the Harpers Ferry Arsenal. Now, the raid only lasted about 48 minutes or 48 hours. He did free dozens of enslaved people outside of farms in the Harpers Ferry area, um, brought them into this firehouse, which you see here um, in the center of Harpers Ferry, to hide out. They took the armory, seemed like we're going well. They had the element of surprise in their hands. But the first major mistake that Brown made was they stopped a trail room, a train, leaving Harper's Ferry. During the stop, a, a free black man who was a watchman was mistaken as an enemy combatant. And one of John, Brown men, John Brown's men actually killed uh, this free African-American watchman. For some reason, they decide to let the train go. As soon as the train leaves, first town they stop in. They talk about how 50 men have attacked Harper's Ferry. Then it becomes 200 men. And then the wire quickly gets to Washington, D.C., where all of a sudden it becomes 500 men are attacking the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. President James Buchanan sends a detachment of soldiers quickly down to Harper's Ferry to stop this insurrection. Now, Brown had hoped to raise up and have enslaved people join in this fight but instead of enslaved people joining in this fight townsfolk surround this area and essentially lay brown and his men in this fire engine house you see here under siege within 24 hours troops arrive in harper's ferry u.s marines under the command of robert e lee and a lieutenant named jeb stewart both obviously will later become prominent figures in the Confederate Army, will arrive and crush the rebellion. They storm the fire engine house. Many are mortally wounded. Brown himself is severely wounded, saved likely by a sword he was wearing where that, that blocked a bullet, maybe the thrust of another sword. Brown is arrested. The insurrection at Harper's Ferry is over. Though the insurrection fails, the aftermath, many historians have argued, had a much greater impact. This spreads like wildfire throughout the country. This is a sensationalized news story, one of the, you know, almost the first in the country. It was news everybody was talking about it these are three papers coming from across the nation north south and people are shocked frederick douglas referred to this as the startling effect of an earthquake and john brown is put on trial and he is essentially wheeled out in a cot because he is still recovering from his wounds the trial begins on the 27th of October in Charlestown, Virginia. It lasted three and a half days. He was eventually defended in court by three Northerners, um, lawyers who came down to help. Closing arguments are October 31st, 1859. The jury deliberated for 45 minutes, returned a verdict of guilty on all accounts, and it was announced that Brown would be hung about a month later, December 2nd, 1859. From November 2nd to December 2nd, 
one month, John Brown would write letters, correspondence. He wrote a hundred letters during this time period, explaining his actions, writing to newspapers. People came to visit him. It is during this time period that you begin to see the defense of him shift. And we'll get into that in a moment. But Brown is going to be executed December 2nd, 1859. No civilians allowed, only military personnel. There's real fear that Brown himself um, was going to be, you know, there were going to be attempts to try to rescue him. That did not happen. Um, but there was one civilian there who actually took a Confederate uniform, not a Confederate uniform, excuse me, a, a army uniform. Um, and that civilian was actually John Wilkes Booth, who was at the, who obviously the assassin of Abraham Lincoln was there and witnessed the death of John Brown. In Boston, at Tremont Temple, which you see here, 4,000 people were in attendance the day of his execution. There, William Lloyd Garrison served as the keynote speaker in the city. John Brown his final words, which would be very prophetic. He said, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. Two years later, the American Civil War had begun. Now, what happened to the Secret Six and the supporters of John Brown? What is the fallout from this? Well, John Brown and Troops raided the Kennedy farm, found a trunk of letters and correspondence. There was a lot of incriminating evidence against all of the members of the Secret Six. Frederick Douglass himself, though not a member of the Secret Six, was also incriminated and had to leave the country. He had to flee. A warrant was put out for his arrest. Um, Garrett Smith had a nervous breakdown and, and was confined to an insane asylum. Um, Samuel Ridley Howe, Frank Sanborn, George Luther Stearns fled to Canada. Theodore Parker himself was already in Italy. Um, unfortunately, he at that time was very sick with tuberculosis, trying to recoup and regain his health. Um, but Thomas Wentworth Higginson, again, steadfast in his devotion to John Brown and unwavering support, refused to flee. Now, there was calls for these individuals to come and testify. They ultimately would not be tried. There was a fear of creating more martyrs. Um, but Frank Sanborn actually in the middle of the night was tried. They tried to arrest him in Concord to bring him uh, to the Senate to testify. He uh, was not arrested as uh, about 150 citizens of Concord rose up to refuse to allow these uh, five marshals to bring him to D.C. Uh, there was also a call for Lewis Hayden to testify. And this is from the report on John Brown. And as you can see here, it says a summons has been issued for Lewis Hayden, but it had not been served. And it was not served because Hayden was African-American, was Black, and they did that. Therefore, they did not want to bring him to come and testify. Intellectuals, people within anti-slavery circles are, are going to speak in favor of John Brown. Seeing him as a martyr, a Christ-like figure. Henry David Thoreau on the left here will write uh, in the immediate aftermath of Harper's Ferry, a public appeal for John Brown called a plea for Captain John Brown. Ralph Waldo Emerson in his speech, you know, very famous speaker for the time period, not usually outwardly political, said in a public address that John Brown will make the gallows glorious like the cross. Brown will be immortalized in artwork, song. And one of the more famous songs that Brown is immortalized in, the song John Brown's Body. Um, now there's conflicting evidence about its origins, where it was written, whether... It was first written here in Boston, whether it was written out on George's Island in the Boston Harbor Islands. Um, regardless, as the story goes, there was a 
a man in a Massachusetts regiment, Scottish born named John Brown, came up with a marching tune. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. That song was heard by Samuel Gridley Howe's wife, Julia Ward Howe. And she rewrote the lyrics to the tune and renamed it the Battle Hymn of the Republic. She became one of the most well-known songs to come out from the American Civil War. John Brown's body would be returned to North Elba. This is the grave for his father, as well as for John Brown and John Brown's son. The home today you can visit, it is a museum. And in conclusion, I wanna wrap up with the words uh, from Frederick Douglass when speaking about John Brown. What he said was, Douglass said, I could speak for the slave. John Brown could fight for the slave. I could live for the slave. John Brown could die for the slave. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I am happy to take any questions that came in through the chat. So I can help to facilitate that. Just want to say a great job, Sean. Uh, definitely an interesting topic to cover. Uh, and you did a good job um, informing us in a way that's very um, helpful to follow along with. So I'll start with the questions that we had uh, submitted prior, uh, and then I'll jump to the chat. So keep the ones in the chat coming. But just starting off with one of the questions that was submitted uh, when people registered, we have a question, how could non citizens of Virginia be guilty of treason against Virginia? So because the act was committed on Virginia soil, like the attacking of the Harpers Ferry Arsenal, um, trying to start an insurrection, those were crimes that were punishable in Virginia. There was talk about federal crimes being charged, um, but it was determined in communication between the Virginia governor, Henry Wise, and the president, um, James Buchanan, that it made the most sense to just try him quickly um, in Virginia under Virginia law. And the other thing, too, was that if it was a federal crime, he would have had to been transferred to a federal courthouse in order to be tried federally. And there was some real fear that, you know, that might not have worked because, again, John Brown is the embodiment of the South's worst nightmare, right? He's a, he's a Northerner, a white man who's backed by wealthy Northern abolitionists to come into the South and try to start a slave insurrection. Um, so there was violence in the air, real fear um, that, you know, that could happen. So the idea was to have a trial, but do it quickly. I see. Thank you. All right. And then just one more that was previously submitted. Uh, and you kind of covered this, um, covering the Secret Six and um, the abolitionist participation in Boston. Um, but if you had anything else to share about groups who, who supported John Brown here in Boston specifically. Yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of general sentiment, especially for John Brown, is there there is some there's some support for him, especially with his actions in Kansas. He's he's a you, know, you see a lot of newspapers refer to him as like, uh, you know, old John Brown or Captain John Brown of Osawatomi fame. Right. That that's a battle that, you know, I think he's, he's has him in positive light. Um, after the insurrection of Harpers Ferry, you're going to see kind of a, a mixed reaction, whether people are saying, you know, speaking out, saying this is too violent. I do not agree with this. Um, you know, it's shock. But then as time progresses, more letters come out. You know, I think people begin to, to change. Even William Lloyd Garrison himself will speak in favor of John Brown and, you know, say that, you know, he's a pacifist and he would prefer the actions of a Lexington and Concord Bunker Hill Harpers Ferry over just, you know, like the inaction of these these pro-slavery hypocrites, essentially, is what he's saying. So I think the support of him grows over time, especially as, you know, you get further removed from Harpers Ferry. And he's seen more of that that martyr um, for the anti-slavery cause. Nice. All right. So I'll move on to the ones from the chat. Not sure if you're familiar with all of the um, Secret Six um, uh, members, uh, but the question was just which of the Secret Six are buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery? 
It's a great question. Um, I know that I'm pretty positive that Samuel Gridley Howe and George Luther Stearns are buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Um, as far as the others, I'm not a hundred percent sure, and I don't think they're. I think those are the only two that are buried there. You can always check out Find a Grave. It's a great cemetery to actually visit if you can. Yeah, for sure. Um, so then the other question, uh, just acknowledging that uh, John Brown is one of the very few people who truly felt Blacks were equal to whites. Uh, for example, he would invite them to dinner uh, and also um, and, uh, participate um, in other aspects with Black folks. So just curious, which other abolitionists truly felt similarly um you know i think there are varying levels of abolitionists feeling similarly to john brown but i think john brown's actions and the way that he lived his life were so extreme that like he he spoke but he lived it and he lived it to again that that utmost extreme where he he sees himself as you know Yes, I have, you know, failed this insurrection, but I've given up my life to end the institution of slavery. I, I you know, you read the words of like a W.E.B. Du Bois or Frederick Douglass or even I, I, I'm, I was looking for it. And I can't I, in my, my head. I think Malcolm X spoke favorably about John Brown. I think he is someone who. Represented like, you know, not only again the words but the the lived he lived what he spoke and and did so very much to the extreme yeah i definitely got that and um the douglas quote that you chose to read at the end there thank you all right um another question for you um just if you um know uh whereabouts wendell phillips house was I do. Um, it is, if you give me one moment, I can drop you. Um, I think it was Beach Street or right around there. It's in like the roughly the Chinatown area. Um, give me one second. I'll drop it in. Do you know if that still stands? It does not. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask another question. And yeah. I can all right, I'll move on. But that was a new fact for me, the uh, Harriet Tubman uh, getting to uh, their interaction. That was cool. All right. Uh, just curious if you can comment about the secret six members who fled. Uh, they say they assume they all came back with no repercussions. Yeah, so ultimately what happens is that with the Secret Six, they, um, you know, there's calls for them to testify in front of the Senate, um, but no one is going to actually, there's a real fear that like, you know, once this word gets out, that's why everyone fleed and went to Canada. But the federal government essentially decides not to press any charges against any of them because they um, did not want to make more martyrs. Um, because it was clear that, that Brown had become this martyr and they did not want to make any more martyrs to this cause. So they ultimately decide not to press any charges. And by the time they wrap up the commission, um, we're staring down a few months later, the Civil War is going to break out. So, it, it, you know, that kind of, I think, pushes that a little bit um, to the back burner. But yeah, like Thomas Wentworth Higginson is someone who never like when <laughs> he... If I'm remembering correctly, I think he get married and on his honeymoon, he brought his new bride to Harper's Ferry and just like showed sights about where the raid occurred. So he was he was another one who very much lived and breathed and embodied, uh, you know, what he what he stood for. I don't know how good of a honeymoon that would be, but. <laughs> nice. Uh, I think that covers our the follow up question. Uh, pretty similar. But then we have a new one. Uh, if you're familiar with what happened to the sons of John Brown did any of them carry on the cause yeah so um and I apologize I don't have the specific names in front of me I know I, I think there was John Brown Jr. who became you know kind of an advocate for for continuing you know and sharing John Brown's legacy um Frank Sanborn actually will live into the 1900s not his son but becomes a keeper of Brown's legacy but then there's another son I think it's Owen Brown 
one of them moves out west to California and basically just tries to leave all of this behind and just like, you know, disassociate with anything John Brown, um, you know, remove and forget about Harper's Ferry. So it's definitely a mix. And you saw that throughout Brown's life where, you know, there's varying levels of commitment from his children and, you know, justifiably. So, I mean, if you're, you know, Liam, again, you know, I mean, he is involved in the Pottawatomie massacre. His children are involved in that massacre. And, you know, that that's, that's murdering in cold blood. So there are people who are going to have some of those nervous breakdowns and, and will leave, um, you know, Brown and, and separate themselves um, from his activities. Thank you. This is the last question, unless anyone um, adds any into the chat, and you're welcome to do so. Uh, but uh, ending us off, we have, oh, got one more. We do have three more minutes, so we can fit in both. But just curious, what was support for John Brown only in Beacon Hill, or were there supporters elsewhere in Boston? Um, yeah, so there there were supporters elsewhere. I think there were varying levels of contributions. You know, for this, I was kind of focusing again just on like Lewis Hayden and the Secret Six. But I, I do know that, you know, he did see support from other areas kind of outside of the city and outside of specifically Beacon Hill. And one of the reasons why they focused on like someone like a Sam and Ridley Howe was he actually just did have a lot of money. Um, so that would allow him to to lend, you know, much more and much greater financial support. Um, but, you know, he is going to get support and, and assistance from from other people um, outside of Beacon Hill. Great. Uh, and do you know if uh, John Brown ever published any, uh, uh, authored any books, essays or articles? Explain. So he definitely is going to write a ton of letters. He He has a very strong written record. And, you know, I think which bodes well for um not the again not the greatest public speaker but in that time period especially when he's in jail he actually will he created like he wrote a constitution for this new anti-slavery government um and he also expresses his views very explicitly in a lot of these letters and this correspondence which will be published and shared in newspapers so his views in in you know his ideas about what occurred the failure and where he sees things going were very well documented by Brown himself. Awesome. All right, last one. Uh, how many other participants were hung besides John Brown? So I, don't, I, and I apologize, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but I think there were several that were captured in the fire engine house fort. And then there were a couple other individuals, I think three or four of them who were able to escape, you know, whether from the Kennedy farm or they were just kind of like outside, they were not holed up in the fire engine house. They were eventually caught, captured and hung as well. And I apologize. I don't know the exact number, um, but it was several other people besides just John Brown. Thank you, Sean. That is it for our questions. We are nearing the end of our time here. So I'm going to pass it off to Karen. But again, thank you for your um, questions and great job, Sean. Thank you. I'm still like processing as I always do. I learned so much during these presentations. And I also, fun fact about me, can play the battle. What is it? What is it? The battle hymn? Battle hymn of the Republic? I can play that on the clarinet. Go me. <laughs> Thank you so much. This this is absolutely amazing. I love it. Um, Thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday night. And join us again for Valentine's Day. Just so happens to be Valentine's Day, woo, on the 14th, where we'll be talking with Jennifer about um, Boston's Black musical history. Woo! And I put that in the chat before, so hopefully if you guys click on it now, because when everything shuts off, it might go away. So click on it now. Yeah. Okay, good. And uh, we'll see you then. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely epic. I appreciate it. Have a good night.